What are you doing? Stop! God! God! Emotion is a state characterized by physiological arousal. So this includes changes in facial expressions, gestures, posture, tone of voice, you know, all that kind of nonverbal stuff. But it also definitely has your own subjective experience as a component. So I'm just talking about your personal kind of feeling of being sad or angry or happy and so on. Now, the emotions that we feel definitely seem to have a purpose. You don't just have emotions because they're fun or whatever. Emotions serve a purpose. And that purpose is to help us feel motivated, to help us, uh, you know, achieve our goals. Like if, for example, you're starving, you might find that you will become angry. You'll become irritable. It's very common for people to be angry when they're hungry. And that anger seems to be a way to help us, you know, just basically get ready to kill and eat something. Ho hopefully you're not killing and eating things when you're angry. Hopefully you just, like, go to in and out or whatever. But you get the idea. Like, our emotions are definitely tied to our adaptive behaviors. Those behaviors we need to engage in just to survive. There's three major theories of emotion. You have the James Lang theory, the, the Cannon Bard theory, and the Schachter Singer two factor theory. So, with the James Lang theory, what's going on is that, you know, external stimuli are detected by sen our sensory systems, and then our body will automatically react to those stimuli. And then we're basically just observing how we're reacting. And based on our reaction, we determine, you know, how what kind of emotion should we feel? Like, if, if I'm shaking because I, a bear is about to maul me, then that's probably fear. So that's the kind of feeling I would have. That's the subjective quality, you know. It's all based on how your body reacts to the stimulus. But the, the second theory is the cannon barred theory of emotion. So with this one, you have two separate processes occurring simultaneously. So, you know, the external stimulus, you know, that bear that's about to attack you, your senses pick that up and send it to the brain. And then deep in the limbic system, uh, that information is processed as both a physiological response, you know, like shaking and fear, and also at the exact same time, it's processed as just more, a more intellectual, subjective sensation of fear. So you are determining based on the stimulus that you should be afraid and also that your body is going to start shaking. So it's just kind of like coincidental in that sense. And then the third theory of emotion is the Schachter Singer two factor theory. And with this one, when you sense an external stimulus, your body will automatically react. So you see the bear, you start shaking in fear, and then your your more intellectual component, your more like subjective component is just going to kind of observe what's going on look at the external stimulus, compare it to how your body reacts, and then make a decision as to what emotion should this be. Like, you know, there's this bear, and I'm reacting in this way, so this should be fear, I suppose. A researcher by the name of Robert Pluchik developed an interesting model of emotion. So he argued that there's eight different kinds of emotions, and they can vary in terms of their intensity. So those eight emotions would be fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, anger, anticipation, joy, and trust. So like I said, they can be more or less intense. So the most extreme version of fear would be terror, and the extreme ver version of disgust would be loathing, and so on. But the interesting thing about the model is that you can also kind of combine uh, emotions that are close to each other. So fear and surprise are right next to each other. So when you combine the two, you get a more complex kind of an emotion called awe. I've already talked a lot about the limbic system in this video series, but just to remind you, the limbic system is our emotional center. 
So there are numerous structures throughout the limbic system that process our most basic kind of emotions. When it comes to the more complex emotions, now, you know, other parts of the brain are going to get involved. But in general, emotional processing occurs first and most in our limbic systems. Specifically, fear. You know, really basic kind of emotions like fear are processed almost entirely in the limbic system. Uh, there is a structure called the amygdala that fear is pretty much, you know, all it does. So if we stimulate the amygdala, then you would feel like intense sensations of fear. Emotion and motivation are two heavily interconnected processes. When you feel intense amounts of emotion, that usually drives you to complete certain kinds of goals. Um, and these intenses of emotion, they tend to be linked with our physio physiological you know, responses. So I'm talking about the autonomic nervous system. Remember, the autonomic nervous system, it has two branches, the parasympathetic branch and the sympathetic branch. And when you feel emotions like fear or anger, then your sympathetic branch is going to be showing more activity. So your heart rate's going to go up, your breathing rate's going to increase, your muscles are going to tense, you'll probably start sweating, and so on. So when you feel these kinds of physiological reactions to, you know, something like anger or fear, that's basically just preparing your body to accomplish a related goal, like maybe, for example, fight off an attacker or something like that, or run away from an attacker. But if you're feeling different kinds of emotions like sadness or, you know, just contentment, you know, joy even, then the parasympathetic branch is going to be showing more activity. So this is the one that's going to kind of quiet your body and just reduce these kinds of you know, muscle tension and things like that. But being too emotional in either extreme can actually be deadly. So being extremely fearful or being extremely depressed can actually result in sudden death. So you could have a heart attack, is what I'm talking about. If you're, if you're too stressed out, your heart won't be able to handle it, and you could die from that. And if you do have a heart attack, if you, or if you just have this highly increased level of activity in your sympathetic nervous system, but it doesn't kill you, well, you're not out of the woods yet, because you can actually die from what's called parasympathetic rebound, where your heart rate, which used to be skyrocketing, basically just slows to a stop. Now the autonomic nervous system is definitely a good way to measure emotion. So we can measure your emotional state by, you know, looking at things like heart rate, you know, uh, breathing rates, blood pressure, you know, all that stuff. All that stuff that's related to being tense, to being nervous, to being fearful. And we can measure that using a lie detector, you know, a polygraph machine. So that's what those things measure. Lie detectors don't measure the truth. How can you possibly measure something abstract like truth? Instead, they just measure to see if you're afraid, basically. But the thing about it is, even if you're very confident and you don't personally feel afraid when you lie, most people, all people, unless you have a psychological disorder, we will have a slight twinge of anxiety every time we know we're lying. Every time we know we're purposefully lying, there's always like some telltale sign. And that's what these polygraph machines look for. They look for those tiny little signs that most people wouldn't notice, but are definitely detectable using this technology. So, theoretically, if you're perfectly calm and perfectly, you know, content, you could pass a polygraph machine. You could f cheat on a polygraph machine, you know, lie and not get caught. But that generally is not going to be possible because these machines are so advanced nowadays. Es expressing our emotions seems to be a really important way that humans communicate with one another. In fact, the expression of emotion seems to be so important that some of that is clearly innate. What I'm saying is the way we express the most basic kinds of emotions is not learned. You know, you're born understanding how to express things like anger, fear, disgust, 
surprise, happiness, and sadness. In fact, if you show pictures of people expressing these emotions to anybody on the planet, they'll be able to accurately identify what emotional expressions those are, despite the fact that there do tend to be huge differences across cultures regarding the appropriate way to express various kinds of emotion. There are some major and interesting differences between various world cultures regarding how people express their emotions. Just in general, people of Western cultures tend to be very different from Asian cultures, so like the US and Japan, for example. What we tend to see is that expressions of anger, especially amongst men, are much more common and acceptable in Western cultures than they are in Asian cultures. Uh, just, you know, norm if, if you're just walking down the street and you see some guy, you know, screaming at his phone like, what's wrong with you? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, that might seem funny, but we're not going to get really upset about it. It's fairly normal, right? But if you see somebody like that in Japan, like if you are living in Japan and somebody's yelling at somebody else over the phone or yelling at somebody in person, that's alarming. Like, maybe you should call the cops because this guy is crazy. Like, you, you just don't do that. That's just not socially acceptable to show that kind of anger. Now, the last thing I wanted to mention is the facial feedback hypothesis. Now, the whole idea behind this is that the muscle movements that are required to produce certain kinds of facial expressions can actually result in you feeling the corresponding emotion. So, forcing yourself to smile will make you happier. And forcing yourself to frown will make you less happy, and so on. So this is something that Martin Seligman was talking about, and he argued that we should take advantage of this to have more control over our emotional experiences. He would say something like, if you want to feel happier, smile more. It's that simple. So, if you've ever heard the phrase, you know, put a smile on your face to make the world a better place, well, there actually does seem to be some scientific support for that. And the last thing I wanted to mention in this video is this concept of emotional intelligence, or EQ. So, it's kind of similar to the more traditional kind of intelligence that we were talking about earlier in the video series. But EQ is more so about your ability to perceive the emotional states of other people, to take advantage of your own emotional state and understand your own emotions, and also control your emotions. So it has these different components. And EQ is actually becoming more and more popular. It's becoming a very major topic, especially amongst uh, modern day companies like major corporations like I don't know Google or whatever like they will actually give their new potential employees EQ tests because they want to be able to identify those that would be you know good people like you know outgoing personable individuals they want to try to find who those people are and weed out those that have low EQ scores you know people who are, to put it simply, like antisocial or psychotic. Like they just, they don't understand the emotional experiences of other people. And as a result, they probably wouldn't make a very good employee. 